Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Washington Seniors Wellness Center for this session on reverse mortgages and home equity. We want you to understand the process. We're not selling you anything. We want you to be sure you have all the facts. And we have with us today representatives from the Department of Insurance, Securities, and Banking. And uh, at this time, I would like to have Ms. Lucy Drafton Lowry come up and present and introduce the staff who is here to handle the discussion today. And hope you enjoy. We'll have questions and answers at the end, okay? Thank you. Hello, my name is Lucy Drafton Lowry, Public Affairs Specialist, and I'm here today to introduce Warm Hockbaum, who is the Chief Bank Examiner, who will be talking about reverse mortgages and home equity loans as it affects seniors. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen of the Washington Seniors Wellness Center. My name is Warren Hochbaum. I am appearing before you this morning as a result of my position as Chief Bank Examiner of the Department of Insurance, Securities, and Banking. And we're located uh, about a block from Union Station. Just want you to know that our topic today is reverse mortgages. And reverse mortgages are a relatively new product that have been around for about a decade or so. And generally, reverse mortgages are utilized by folks who are uh, senior citizens, like ourselves. And that's because you might be house rich, but cash poor. And if we take a look at the slide presentation, we start off by defining mortgages. Now, I am originally from New York City, from Brooklyn to be precise, so if I talk funny, that's the reason. Uh, I worked as a bank examiner up north, and I taught university finance classes there as well. But it wasn't until I sat down to do some research for this particular presentation that I actually looked up the definition of the word mortgage. And if you take a look at the slide, the word mortgage is actually a French legal term. And it means, mort, I know, is death in French. Gage comes from the French word for contract. So it means that the pledge, the contract, ends when either the obligation is fulfilled, you've paid it off, or the property is taken through foreclosure, OK? There are a few other methodologies for finishing a contract as well, and we'll go into them during the course of this presentation. There are some problems with reverse mortgages. Uh, regular mortgages have been around in the United States for a few hundred years already, and those are pretty readily understood by the average member of our population. Reverse mortgages are relatively new. They're also complex. They're not very easily understood. They are economically necessary, especially if in your senior years you have insufficient funds to live on. As we all know, while you might be receiving a pension and social security, truth of the matter is that it still becomes difficult to survive unless you have enough money to take care of your necessities. So for someone who is house rich but cash poor, reverse mortgages, despite the difficulties, despite the complexities, might be a very good product for you. First of all, what exactly is a reverse mortgage? It is a secured loan. The security, in this case, as in your original mortgage, being your property, your home. It enables seniors to convert your home equity into cash. The money may be distributed to you in several different ways. Before we go into those methods of distribution, I'd like to speak to you a bit about equity. Many people aren't quite familiar with its meanings. Actually, the word equity has many meanings. It can be the capital of a company. It can be stocks that perhaps you've purchased. Those are also known as equities. But it can also mean the difference between your home's market value 
and the outstanding balance of any mortgage or perhaps any other liens on your property. So if you take a look at the screen, the example is as follows. You have a home that at present is valued at $300,000. You have a mortgage lien of 100000 which means your home equity is 200000 As perhaps you were aware of when you initially purchased a home, buying a house does not necessarily mean that you're the full owner. Who is the full owner? Generally, the bank. <coughs> You made a down payment, you have a tiny piece of the pie. Who has the biggest part of the pizza? The bank. When does the pizza become wholly yours to eat? <laughs> Once you've completely paid it off, okay? Generally, that's not something that takes place in a few years. For the average American, it takes place over 25 or perhaps even 30 years. And that's if you haven't refinanced it along the way. Once you've completely paid it off, you get a certificate from the bank. It's no longer their property. Now it's yours, free and clear. However, why does the bank decide to make this reverse mortgage to you? Number one, the bank doesn't love you. Number two, they love their business relationship with you. That's how banks make their money, how they profit, how they take care of interest to their depositors, how they take care of any type of dividends they might be to folks who own bank stock, also known as bank equity. The lender, however, can discuss with you different methodologies for payment. And those different methodologies might include a lump sum. Some people want all the money up front. I'm going to take that 100000 and go on that round-the-world cruise. I'm going to take that money and buy a new Cadillac. I'm going to take that money, put my grandchildren through college. I'm going to take that money and buy my son or daughter a new home. All wonderful, all dependent upon you, your health, your family, whatever your situation might be. You can also receive a line of credit. What precisely is a line of credit? It's very similar to receiving a credit card. The bank will say, for example, your line is $100,000. You draw down when you wish, and the interest is paid on that portion that you're drawing down. You might be paying fees on the entire sum, by the way, but the interest is predicated upon the amount of the draw that you particularly are taking down. That's a line of credit. Perhaps you want to go on that Caribbean cruise next month. Perhaps your grandchildren won't be going to university till next year. That's when you'll draw down that portion. Perhaps you won't buy that new car for your son or daughter till two years down the road. That's when you'll take care of paying that portion. And that's why many people opt for the line of credit rather than the lump sum. Some people are afraid, by the way, if they obtain a lump sum, the impact will be so huge in their mindset that they'll be forced to go out and spend it. We've all seen on television or read in the newspaper about people who have won the lottery, millions and millions of dollars. Three years later, they're poor again. What happened? They just went berserk. They spent every dime that they had, and they even borrowed in many cases and spent additional money. If you have the line of credit, you're taking money when you need it when your family circumstances dictate that the money should be taken out and distributed as you see fit. You can also opt for a monthly amount. Hmm. You need so much in the way of living expenses, 2000 3000 4000 a month. That's another way to go. And in this way, the bank gives you something akin to an annuity. So you have the funds necessary to do whatever activities you wish to enjoy. And the bank is making interest each month as they give you pieces of that annuity money. So both sides are happy with this particular arrangement. Important question, how and when can you get the money? The reverse mortgage is not aimed at the average American. 
It's aimed at those of us who are senior citizens. What is the government's definition of a senior in the case of reverse mortgage, minimum age 62? So if you're under 62, you cannot obtain it. If you are 62, you can obtain a certain amount. If you're 72, with the same house, the same mortgage, the same circumstances, you can obtain more. If you're 82, even more. Obviously, the bank sees that as someone ages, they will have their opportunity because, unfortunately, as you're older, you're not going to be around that much longer. And from the bank's perspective, remember, they're in a money-making proposition. They're hoping to get paid off as soon as possible. They're not going to send people out to do you in. Don't have to worry about that. But remember, they are interested in profiting from this arrangement. That's the bank's perspective, and that's the truth. So we've spoken about the age. What else is there? The appraised value of your home. As we all know, in D.C., the appraised value of homes has been shooting up in the last decade tremendously. I had mentioned that I'm a Brooklyn boy. I don't have to say 15, 20 years ago, most parts of Brooklyn were terrible. But as a result of gentrification, things have changed drastically. I still mentioned to my wife and uh, other members of our family that the apartment that I lived in, in what used to be, as a child, a very depressed portion of Brooklyn, my dad paid $160 a month rent for us. And he said it was probably $100 too much. <laughs> that apartment recently sold for $550,000. So, in hindsight, if I had just held on to it for another 45 years, <laughs> this would have been a great windfall, okay? Unfortunately, we left to move to another part of Brooklyn that my folks thought would be better, okay? So appraisals have been creeping up, which means that the valuation of your home has been creeping up. And as that lifts up, it lifts up the amount of money that you will be eligible to receive. Another piece of the puzzle is the home equity. How much of the home do you actually own? Now, I have a good friend, John, a retired attorney in uh, Queens, New York, and he has a home that's been valued at about $600,000, and his four sons are all uh, grown and moved out, and he and his wife are wondering what to do. Well, they had taken out home equity loan. What is a home equity loan? It is a type of mortgage whereby, based upon the equity in your home, they give you a particular percentage of that. So let's say John's home is worth 600000 He and his wife take out perhaps 60% of that. But wait, that's a problem. What's the problem? Now they've jacked up their mortgage from zero to uh, $360,000. So although they're in their 60s, the amount of equity in their home has diminished due to the fact that that home equity loan has reduced the amount of equity that John and his wife Marlene particularly own. What else is important? Interest rates. Interest rates in the past few years have been historically low. If I remember correctly, these interest rates are the lowest that they've been in the last 100 years. As such, many people feel it's the prime time to get involved in a borrowing situation because interest is so unbelievably low. And this has not transpired in many, many years. I do recall that when my older brother was married in 1980, he and his wife bought a home in New Jersey. Interest rates at that time were 16%. They married and purchased at the high point of the cycle, okay? It hasn't been that high since. They refinanced almost a decade later when interest rates were down to a measly 10.5% and thought, we got a steal. 
only 10.5%. Life is wonderful, okay? Now that interest is so unbelievably low, there's a possibility of you taking out even more money from your account. Another factor, this home must be a primary residence. It can't be something that you rent out to others, lease out to others. You must be the owner who is occupying that residence. It's in your name and you're occupying it. The last factor on my list is no federal debt delinquencies. You cannot owe money to Uncle Sam. If you have tax liens outstanding, if you have any type of old student loans from decades ago outstanding, stop. All of these other obligations must be repaid prior to your obtaining this, okay? So we know that there are a lot of items that you have to go through in your checklist prior to being able to even walk into the bank office or into the mortgage bank office and inquire about the possibility of your receiving this loan. If we go to the next slide, I looked up on the internet a very typical example. Here we have a case where John and Jane Doe have a home that's valued at 300000 there's a 100,000 mortgage outstanding. Therefore, John and Jane have a $200,000 equity in this. I looked up a typical 64-year-old in the actuarial tables because remember, the banks and the government look at this on an age-wise basis. And remember, those of us lucky enough to grow up in America are enhancing our age limitations every year due to advances in health and nutrition and medical science. At age 64 with $200,000 equity, you would be able to get $82,909 out of this particular example. What about the interest rate levied? 3.21%. Pretty darn good, I think so, okay? Now, what does that mean? That means that roughly 120000 in equity would remain your ownership of your home, and 82000 would be the bank's ownership as a result of this reverse mortgage. But remember, you also have your primary mortgage with the remaining $100,000 on it. The primary mortgage, you still must continue to pay. This new mortgage, the reverse mortgage, is something that can be repaid, not now, but in the future. I took off the internet a table, and if you take a look at the table, I didn't want to make it too difficult, but down on the left-hand side, it has interest rates. The top half has property valued at 100000 the bottom half has property valued at 200000 We have interest rates from 5% to 8% for both valuations. And along the top axis, it has the age of the youngest co-borrower. Now, what do we mean by co-borrower? If you purchased it with a spouse, okay? The way the reverse mortgage works, you can have one spouse who's older one spouse who's younger, but it's the age of the younger spouse that is primarily important. So if you're both listed on the deed, both listed on the original mortgage, and one is very young and one is old, then it might become a problem. Just to get back to this slide, if you take a look at the top axis, we move from the youngest co-borrower in this example, which is 65, to the oldest which is 90. If we take a look under the 65 for the $100,000 valuation, how much would the 65-year-old young kid be able to get? $59,488. What if this person is, well, married to a 90-year-old? Well, the 90-year-old, if you look under 90, would be entitled to get 20,000 more or 79,233. 
why is the bank interested in giving more to the elderly versus the younger participant? Because the elderly won't be using the money according to statistical tables, actuarial tables, for that much of a longer time frame, okay? But all in all, it works out to everyone's benefit. If we look down at the bottom ones, 5% for a $200,000 ownership equity, the 65-year-old can obtain $128,588 on a $200,000 valuation. The 90-year-old would be able to obtain $165,223. So this is the way this particular table works out. And this, in particular, is aimed at FHA, Federal Housing uh, Administered Mortgages. If we take a look at the next slide, if you take a peek, it mentions your debt rises each month. Remember, if you're taking money on a monthly basis, you owe more to the bank each month. If you take out a lump sum, it's still going to rise. Why is that? Interest is accruing, being added to the principal each and every month. The bank offers you money, but they also wish to get repaid for their offering. They're not doing it because they're your friend. They're doing it because they're a reputable business organization and are involved in a reputable business deal. Interest is added to the balance. Now, by the bank's portion increasing each month, the corollary also becomes true. Your equity is reduced each month. The bank's ownership increases, your ownership decreases as interest eats away on a monthly basis at your ownership portion. On top of this, again, if you recall when you initially took out a regular mortgage, there were fees attached. Guess what? The banks are going to charge you fees as well. If they're involved in a deal, they need their mortgage officers to take a look at your background. They have to do a credit check on you. They have to do an appraisal. They have to have their legal people take a look at all the documentation. This costs them money. It's not that they're trying to beat you into the ground with fees. It's that they wish to have their costs amortized over the amount of people involved in the borrowing process. There are also insurance premiums. Remember, you have to keep your home insured. If heaven forbid there's a fire or something happens uh, in Brooklyn last November, many people who lived near the seashore, even a few hundred yards from the seashore, were wiped out when Hurricane Sandy hit. The floods inundated, in many cases, two, three, four, five blocks closest to the beach. And that meant that your basement was completely wiped out. I know of one commercial entity, six months they still haven't pumped the water out of the basement, which leads me to believe that this is a complete write-off. Six months of water sitting there, everything must have been destroyed, all the wires, all the cables, the walls, the plaster. Uh, I think it's just waiting for the wrecking ball to finish its job and then decide what the heck to put up over it. So insurance, premiums, very, very necessary. Let's go to the next portion. Reverse mortgages usually cause your portion of equity to reduce. Okay, we can't explain that too much because there are many people who don't understand the concept. The bank's portion increases, your piece of the pizza decreases in size. Each month's interest results in a further reduction in your equity. You may have taken a lump sum five years ago and then say, why is my equity decreasing? Again, you're not holding that 100000 because the bank loves you. You're holding it due to the fact that they are charging interest. And every month as their portion increases, your portion, the corollary, decreases. It's a fact of life. If you live long and do not repay, then, this is a very important question for people, the home may effectively become an asset of the bank. 
So there are some people who say, I don't have any heirs, or I don't wish to leave my property to anyone. It's me, perhaps me and my spouse, and that's it. Well, in that particular case, that's fine. And the bank will, upon your leaving the scene, will effectively be able to do as they wish. Generally, what they wish to do is to sell it. And we've all heard, unfortunately, in these t terrible financial crisis years, that there have been many foreclosures. We might even know people who have been foreclosed upon. If the home is valued at 300000 and your mortgage is 100000 and I'm talking now about a straight mortgage, you still have $200,000 equity. But unfortunately, you've lost your job. You can't afford to pay the mortgage. Guess what? After going through their legal procedures, and this, depending upon the State of the Union, might take a few weeks or a few months, the bank legally has the right to sell your home. Now remember, we said the home is valued at 300000 The bank has a mortgage of 100000 How much do they have to sell it for? Legally, if they sell it for a hundred, they walk away happy. What about your $200,000 equity? Lost gone, disappeared, into the distance. That's not the bank's problem. They signed a contract with you. They agreed to give you the money at interest. You agreed to pay. Unfortunately, you lost your position. You're no longer able to pay, and therefore, it's whatever the bank needs to do. What if they sell it for 200000 Well, then they'll say, we take the top 100, you could take the next hundred thousand. But they're under no obligation, remember, to give you a dime. Whatever they can get and walk away with, they're very, very happy to get. And that's the truth of the matter. Okay, how does a person convert into a mortgage and what type of home equity, excuse me, reverse mortgages are there. In this particular case, we're focusing on a Federal Housing Administration insured product. Now, these comprise roughly 80% of mortgages, okay? Most people opt for an FHA because the government is in charge of the standards, the principles. If you have any type of complaint, it's easier for the government agencies to come to assist you. We hope that doesn't happen, but remember, on occasion it does occur. The government program has certain controls in place that can keep an eye on the financial institution, whether it's a bank, whether it's a mortgage bank, to make sure that they serve you and service you in a proper manner. Now, there are 20% of these reverse mortgages, which might be considered private mortgages. Different banks come out with different methodologies, different interest rates, different amounts of money to give you. Some of them, in certain parts of the country, you might consider more relevant to your particular needs and requirements at a particular time. You might opt for that. Does that mean there is a problem with these? Not at all. It's just not backed by the government. It could be a completely legitimate product that is offered by a reputable banking organization or a reputable mortgage banking organization. The established design, again, a very big factor is based upon your age or the age of your partner, if both of you own the home. And they can generally offer you between 52% and 77% of the appraised value of the home. If you're older, you'll obtain closer to the 77%. If you're closer to 62, that much younger, you'll probably get closer to 52% of the appraised home equity owned valuation of your home. Remember, there are fees, and in this particular instance, from the information I was able to generate, fees might be as high as 2%. So if you're obtaining $50,000, you might have to pay $1,000 in fees. 100000 you might have to give back 
uh, $2,000 in fees. Remember, when you closed on your original mortgage, they had closing costs. And some people are not prepared, or their attorney or legal advisor or banking person hasn't really prepped them. And I still remember 30 years ago, when I was a bit younger and had more hair on my head, I was in a bank in Queens, New York, and there was a young couple purchasing a home. And this was before computers and laptops and everything had been hand generated. Turns out their lawyer gave them incorrect figures. Instead of 5,000 in closing costs, they had to pay 15,000. The wife just burst into tears. We don't have that kind of money. We just got married a year ago. And don't know what happened, but it was just a very poignant situation with this young lady crying her heart out and nobody knowing exactly what to do at that time. So remember, if you're budgeting for a reverse mortgage, everything might not be yours free and clear. You'll have expenses, you'll have fees, you'll have insurance. There will be payments for you to undertake. So don't think it's all empty. Once you get your money, you will have more things to do, more payments to make. Also, very, very important, the Federal Housing Administration insists on loan counseling. Before you take out this FHA mortgage, they must tell you that there are, I believe in DC, four agencies that do counseling, okay? And you must sit down with a counselor and spend an hour or two discussing your particular situation, your life, your lifestyle, your hopes and dreams for your family, your home, what you intend to do with the mortgage money. They're trying to talk you out of any frivolous uses, and they're trying to talk you into only doing this when it's important to pay for any type of family emergency, family difficulty, family situation that uh, has occurred in your particular situation. They will explain to you about the fees, the mortgage, all of the information that is relevant in your case. So counseling, I think, is wonderful. Now, it's funny, but I was just speaking to someone this past week about the fact that in New York City, I had spoken to many consumer groups about finance and credit and mortgages. And initially, I was somewhat surprised to discover that the typical American, or perhaps I should say the typical New Yorker, had very little knowledge of finance or interest rates or what was going on. The best group by far that I ever spoke to, the most knowledgeable, that asked the best and the most questions, was a group of women ladies only, so forget about the guys, ladies. And this group of women had just gotten out of prison. And they were in halfway houses trying to start their life again. And I was asked to come back, speak to them about opening bank accounts and credit. And they said, oh, they had plenty of time to read while they were away. <laughs> and that's why that was the best questioning group I had ever spoken to. I know it sounds funny, but it's true. Okay, we're coming into the next slide. And what is this one? How the heck does one repay a reverse mortgage? Number one, if you move. If you recall what we had said a few moments ago, this must be your primary residence. It must be owner occupied. If you decide, the heck with living up north, I'm moving down to Florida, I'm moving to Arizona or Vegas or wherever, the reverse mortgage contract has come to an end. And it's up to you to get together with your bankers to discuss repaying the borrowings that you took from them. Obviously, the contract is over, as I said in my first slide, if the individual dies contract has officially come to an end. But there are also other factors. What if you fail to pay your property tax? Well then, the bank is afraid that if you don't pay your property tax, who has first dibs on your property? The county, the city, the municipality, the state, the district. The tax man comes first, and therefore, 
The bank is afraid that if you owe $1,000, the city might legally sell your home for $1,000, even though it's worth $300,000. You've just satisfied your tax lien. And the fact that it's been sold to someone else is your loss and their gain. What if you fail to pay insurance? Remember, the bank is concerned. They want you to take good care of your property because if you let it get run down, if you let it burn to the ground, heaven forbid, they're losing as well. All they have is a hole in the ground. They want to get repaid. If you fail to maintain the property, I can remember once going out with a bank officer to Long Island, the eastern end of New York City, where there was a situation when a uh, particular home was being foreclosed upon. And the man took me to see the home, and the property was completely not kept up. The neighbors had come at night and taken out all the shrubbery, taken out the bushes, taken out the grass, which I had never even thought of before. The house was used, it looked like, by the neighborhood kids based upon the number of beer cans there. This is very detrimental to the bank. They have to resell this property. They don't want it to be messed up. So that's why they would send a person on occasion, depending upon the bank, to do what we in the office always called an eyeball appraisal. Just to drive by your home one day, is it still standing? Is it in good upkeep? Is the place being attended to? Okay, they're not going to enter your home. That's your property, your business. But just to take a look to make sure that the average person going by can see that it is well maintained. With respect to mortgages, I was able to ascertain that banks, and these are amongst the biggest banks in America, the first two I'm sure you've heard of, Wells Fargo and Bank of America. The third, MetLife Bank, were the largest institutions in giving out reverse mortgage loans. Now, we've heard of Bank of America, which I believe by assets is still the largest bank in the United States. Wells Fargo is probably in the top four or five largest banks in America. MetLife Bank, if you look at the name, you'll see the connection with MetLife Insurance. About 15, 20 years ago, they obtained a banking license when it became legal. It was probably about 1999, if I remember correctly, so 14 years ago. And what did they do with that banking license? Well, an insurance company makes money by selling you a product and obtaining a premium. And as I used to tell my university classes, insurance, especially life insurance, is a funny subject. Because when you take out a policy, the insurance company is hoping that you live to be 100. And how do you win in this particular deal? Only if you make your first payment and pass quickly. Well, you just scored a uh, lotto. You won $100,000, OK? In this particular instance, MetLife said, if we open a bank, we can get people as they're growing old. And then when they're old, we can get them with reverse mortgages as well. So the bank and the insurance company intertwined in MetLife are in a win-win situation. Now, these are banks just want you to know that you don't necessarily have to go to a bank. If you take a look at the next slide, there are mortgage bankers, mortgage brokers that get involved in these things. Some people don't understand the difference between a bank and a mortgage banker or a broker. And the distinction is as follows. A bank takes in deposits and makes loans. We're all familiar with that. They're a depository institution. Other financial organizations, such as an insurance company or a mortgage bank or a broker, they're not allowed to accept deposits. They sell you a product, and then they get premiums or fees out of you. A mortgage banker can actually make a mortgage from their funds to you, but in many cases, what they're looking is to collect the closing fees up front, and then they will immediately sell 
your mortgage in what's known as the mortgage-backed security, or MBS market, to a larger financial organization. Financial organizations need to be diverse and to be scattered in different parts of the country. Because if they're concentrated in one area and there's a financial crisis in that area, they'll be wiped out. So they want a piece of Brooklyn, they want a piece of DC, they want a piece of Virginia, a piece of Maryland, a piece of New Jersey, Connecticut, and all these other parts of the country as well. And as a result, they're looking to ensure that they have no concentrations, but they're diffuse around the country. With respect to mortgage bankers and brokers, we have a listing here of the uh, six top mortgage, uh, reverse mortgage lenders in the United States. We have Liberty Home Equity Solutions, also known as Genworth. We have Security One Lending. We have One Reverse Mortgage. We have American Advisors Group, Urban Financial Group, and Generation Mortgage Company. And these organizations, while not banks, because they don't take in deposits, they're not FDIC insured, they have the legal right to operate. Many of them are licensed here by my agency, the Department of Insurance, Securities, and Banking. And what they do is provide aid in filling out the applications, getting all of the mortgage uh, papers together, and then they obtain a fee for this, and then in many cases they sell the final product to banks and what's known as a mortgage-backed security, and that's how they make their funds, okay? If you take a look at repayment, how are we going to repay this tremendous amount of money? Now, it is possible that the repayment will only come about as a result of a sale of the house, which might not necessarily be a bad thing if you're in no condition to operate the home anymore, if you move, or unfortunately, if the end of days comes to pass, then a sale might be the best thing between the family members that are remaining as your uh, descendants, or uh, whatever the bank advisors might speak to you about as well. You or your heirs might have other funding available, and you might decide this home has been in the family for so many years, so many decades, perhaps a couple of generations. We want to continue it, and therefore the family might get together and try to repay the total amount of principal and interest that came about as a result of the reverse mortgage. Now, unfortunately, with all the good things that these reverse mortgage products give us, there are always potentials for theft, for scams. And especially with seniors, in many, many occasions, there have been reports of scams being perpetrated on people. So all that we want you to know is do not respond to any unsolicited advertisement. If someone knocks on your door and says he or she could get you a great deal, stop. A red warning sign should be flashing in front of you. I've had unfortunate situations back up north where seniors would come in and say, oh, it was a well-dressed man and he uh, said, you don't need a lawyer, just sign here on the dotted line. And he looked nice and spoke educated, so I signed. Don't fall for that scam. You should not do anything unless you've discussed it with people you trust, a legal advisor, a knowledgeable friend or family member. Be suspicious if someone claims you don't have to worry about payments. We'll take care of that. Some cases people have tried to transfer ownership from an unsuspecting, unaware senior to themselves. So if, heaven forbid, once you pass, instead of the remnant of the home equity going to your family members, it'll go to this stranger because he obtained your signature on the dotted line. So therefore, I can't reiterate enough times, do not sign anything that you do not 
understand, okay? Seek out your own mortgage counselor. And remember, if it's an FHA-approved reverse mortgage, which accrues to about 80% of the reverse mortgages sold in the United States at the present, you must go for FHA counseling. There are four agencies in the district that provide this counseling free of charge, and that's how you will obtain knowledgeable information about what to do, where to go, how to do it, and who perhaps even to stay away from. Okay? Now, ladies and gentlemen of the Washington Seniors Wellness Center, I'd like to thank you for your participation. And at this point, I'd like to ask, does anyone have any particular questions you'd like me to try to answer? Yes, sir. Um, telephone solicitation uh, on reverse mortgage. They come in almost daily. Uh, and I, I try to be careful and all that kind of stuff. I just simply hang up. Uh, I don't want to hear it. But if I was to listen, how can I evaluate one of these solicitations, or should I? Okay. Now the question is telephone solicitations. What should I do and how should I handle it? With respect to telephone solicitations, I had a good friend in New York City whose son was working for a mortgage banker. He did straight mortgages. He didn't do reverse mortgages. His job was to make 100 telephone calls a day, and he'd be in the office 8 to 12 hours a day contacting people in lists. They actually had lists of all the doctors, all the dentists, all the lawyers in New York, all the senior citizens who signed up for different items. I would say that if you have any such solicitation, don't follow up unless you feel there is a need if you have a need to obtain information, discuss it with one of those counselors that are here in the district. And otherwise, keep hanging up. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. When you were talking about the foreclosure and you were stating that uh, the bank has the right to foreclose your house, and if you say your house is 300000 and they put it on the market for $100,000, I was confused, but do you get any of that money at all? If the bank's mortgage is 100 and the home sells for that, that's all the bank gets, and you get zero. Usually, and I've only been to one auction, and that was in Brooklyn, so I don't know if this was typical or perhaps a bit different from the norm. In that particular case, there were about 50 or 60 people in the audience, and they had known that it was a foreclosure auction, and there were so many bids on properties. And I wasn't familiar with all of the areas, but the bids generally started at the bank's mortgage, let's say 100000 in this example, but quickly went up to the 300000 which was the true market value of these homes. As a matter of fact, in speaking to one of the realty guys who went there looking to see if he could get cheap properties, he said the best days for him to obtain a, a low cost property was to go in a day that was very rainy or very snowy because a lot of the typical people stayed away and therefore there were instead of the normal 50 or 60 attendees there were only 10 or 20 attendees so there were fewer people to bid against him. So that's a little factoid that may be of help in the future. <laughs> yes ma'am. My question deals with uh, the fact that you're supposed to maintain this property all of the time. You live there 100%. Yes. Now suppose you decide you want to spend maybe three months someplace else. That's that fine. That is not a problem at all. As long as that remains, your pr uh, the question is, what if I move away for a while and I'm um, away for a three-month period? I know in New York, many people from the north, when it gets cold, they flee to Florida for the winter. And uh, as long as the snowbirds still have their primary residence located in their old home, that's no problem at all. I mean, if you're away that length of time, you usually have your mail 
sent with your the mail would be forwarded. Yes, yes. And if a couple of the bushes or shrubs die, that's not a problem. The bank just wants to make sure that the building is in good repair without broken windows or uh, anything that might lead them to believe that you've headed for the hills and moved away long term. Um, does the FHA have any influence or do they establish uh, what can be charged for interest, fees, insurance? Okay, the FHA puts together the package. It's the bank that's actually giving you the product, so it's the bank that charges you all of these things. And each person's situation, as well as each bank's situation, is separate and distinct. I've seen certain financial institutions that levied very high fees, others that levied relatively low fees. And nowadays, especially with the internet, especially if you have someone you trust to look up, I always say, look at 10 or 15 different financial institutions. See which one is best for you in your particular situation. And as a result, you might find that this one might give me more money, but they might charge me a higher interest rate. The other one across the street might give me a few thousand less, but might charge me a lower interest rate. Some might charge you points. Each point is 1% of your mortgage amount. Maybe the other institution will not charge me points. So I can't really personally choose one. Just say what the situation is today will not be reflective of the situation one year from today, nor will it reflect the situation that was one year before. Whenever you're ready to obtain such a product, you have to sit down with your advisors, your family members, and uh, counselors and decide which is best for you and which institution to go to. Yes, ma'am. You mentioned the, uh, they have counselors in this area. Four good counselors, who are they? Yes, I'm, uh, the question is, are there counselors in the district? Yes, there are four agencies which give counseling. I don't have their names right here. We can look them up subsequently on the internet and you can let everyone know. Okay. Would legal counsel for the elderly be a good source to get some information? Legal counseling for the elderly, would they be a good source? Yes, they would be a very, very good source. But you have to be careful. There are many attorneys who are knowledgeable about financial matters, might necessar not necessarily be knowledgeable about mortgage matters. So it would be imperative to discuss things with a legal advisor who's knowledgeable about mortgages and especially with these reverse mortgages. The young lady back there had a question. Yes. I would like to know, could you start repaying your reverse mortgage? Not wait until you die. <laughs> okay, the question is, do you have to wait till you die? Can you repay the reverse mortgage before? Yes. The question is, where are you obtaining this money to repay the reverse mortgage? If you remember, in the first couple of slides, I said a reverse mortgage is a good deal for someone who is house rich but cash poor. If you are house rich but not cash poor, maybe you should just go for a regular refi and refinance the mortgage in a regular manner. You show that you have an income stream, savings, uh, whatever, pensions, 401k, maybe you hit it big in lotto or the stock market. If you have those amounts, then definitely a refi mortgage is the way to go. And again, those same low mortgages of uh, interest rates exist at the present time for refis as they do for reverse mortgages as well. So I can refinance without question. You may refinance as long as your income stream is good enough to uh, afford to repay on a monthly basis. Okay, thank you. What's the difference between the refinance Pretty much it's the same thing. Uh, the question is, what's the difference between a refi and a home equity loan? Uh, refinance and home equity loans are pretty much six of one, half dozen of the other. The idea is you've built up equity, you're of a certain age. Let's say someone is 50 years of age, they've built up $100,000 worth of equity. 
they might need the money now to send Junior off to college. So they'll say, out of that $100,000 worth of equity, I wish to obtain $50,000 to repay uh, college tuition for Junior. And as such, you can refi, get the advantage of those low interest rates, and move on. Someone of 50, of course, is too young to get a reverse mortgage. But home equity and refi is the same thing because all that that means, you've built up ownership in your property. And that ownership is something that banks are willing to lend against. Remember, in this refi instance, it won't be uh, your full ownership anymore. Now it's the bank that's taken back their piece of the pie because they're granting you a certain cash uh, loan. Anyone else? Uh, I had a friend of mine, parents, they, they went into a reverse mortgage and they lost it. Actually, the mom tried to save the house, but she couldn't obtain the finance because of age. Okay, the question is, uh, this gentleman has a friend whose family members had gotten involved in a reverse mortgage and they lost the house. Well, remember, it's the bank's contractual obligation with the borrower. The borrower has to either A, repay the home, or uh, the home mortgage, or if they don't have the funds to do it, their heirs and family members have to repay it. And if they don't have the ability, then the bank has 100% legal right to sell the home and get their money back. That's it, free and clear. Uh, if you didn't want to offer that right to the bank, you should not have signed. But these are items that the counselor makes people aware of. Okay? So, yes, ma'am. When the person applies for the refund, if it's a, if it's a couple, both names go on that um, loan request? With respect to a ref uh, the question no, is, okay, if it's a reverse mortgage, do both names, if it's a couple that own the property, go on the mortgage? Uh, in many cases, this is a bit of a tricky situation. If both folks are of similar ages and the younger partner, which is generally in our culture, the spouse, the female spouse, is younger, they must be above age 62, okay? And the amount that you can obtain is based upon the younger person's uh, age, okay? So if you want to obtain a higher amount of money, if the house is in the older person's uh, name, then you'd be able to get it. In the instance that I gave you of the older professor marrying his younger student, at this point in their life where he is 70 and she is 35, she would be completely ineligible. If her name was on the deed with him, they could not obtain a reverse mortgage. If, however, the home is just in Carmine's name, then yes, the home mortgage would be legally allowed and he'd be allowed to get whatever percentage of equity he has at the present time. Because I heard that sometimes um one, one person's name is on a reverse mortgage loan, and the spouse, the person who dies, who had the uh, loan, dies, and then the spouse is left without a home. That's an excellent question, and that goes on to the fact that if the older person is the only one whose name is on the deed, and that person's passed away, what's left for the younger spouse? And the problem is great, because the younger spouse would indeed be left with nothing because the bank would have equity ownership of the property. So these are questions that have to be well thought out beforehand. Uh, in a couple where one spouse might be 70, another spouse might be 90, what are the living arrangements? How old have the family members lived to historically? These all have to go into the uh, picture before a couple decides to sign on the Bottom line, once you've signed, you have, in effect, agreed to the situation. And if a couple does this and the older person passes away relatively soon after, then the younger person is indeed in a bind because other than whatever money they've managed to save from the reverse mortgage, they might be completely out of luck. Something definitely to be thought about, okay? 
okay? But each instance is separate and distinct, okay? So, if there are no more questions, ladies and gents of the Washington Seniors Wellness Center, I'd like to thank you and wish you a good day. Take care.